Hello, this is Dr. Mewborn and this is Christology. We're in Lesson 17 and today we're looking at the Incarnation of Christ, Part 2. Good to be with you. Let's go ahead and jump into our study. We looked at last time the five truths about the Incarnation. You can find these, this section um, and a breakdown of these different truths in the Desiring God website that's put together by John Piper. Um, but I want you to see the five truths one more time because they are very significant in understanding who Jesus Christ is through the Incarnation. Number one, the Incarnation was not the divine Son's beginning. Jesus Christ is eternal. Number two, the Incarnation shows Jesus' humility. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve, give his life as a ransom for many. Then we see thirdly, the Incarnation fulfills prophecy. There are hundreds of prophecies that Jesus Christ fulfilled in his lifetime, and some of those prophecies have yet to be fulfilled, but it's going to take place in the future. Fourthly, the Incarnation is mysterious. As human beings, we can't understand all the ins and outs of the Incarnation because it's beyond our understanding, the very fact that God became man, the Son of God became man in the flesh, just doesn't make a lot of sense to us because we're limited in our understanding. We have finite minds. However, uh, God knows all things, and that's why it may be mysterious to us, but of course God knows and could clearly and clearly reveals things over time as well. And then fifthly, the incarnation is necessary for salvation. In other words, if Jesus Christ had not come, lived, and died on the cross and then rose from the dead, people would still be stuck in their sin. There would be no salvation. There would be no Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus Christ coming and doing these things conquered sin, conquered death, so that through death he would uh, give to us life. And we would not only just receive, not only receive life, but we would receive abundant life, the good life, the life in Christ Jesus, and we would receive eternal life with the Lord God forever. So wonderful truths about the Incarnation. Now a question that's asked a lot of times, speaking of Jesus' existence, did he really exist? And I'm going to share today some examples or some ways we know that Jesus clearly lived. I remember when I was first studying in um, first going to college and one of my first classes at university was a huge class of 300 people and um, and there was a, a teacher that was down there that was addressing the class with a microphone and it was a, a very intimidating class at first but I'll never forget the first day of class she um, she related the story of Jack and the Beanstalk with story of Jesus Christ and she said that Jesus is no nothing more than another fable or another story like Jack and the Beanstalk and I know and knew in that moment um, at the University of South Florida that it was this was going to be a difficult class and it was a difficult class to work through things because she was a, a complete atheist but why would why would people say that Jesus never existed when there's tremendous amounts of evidence for these things? I want to take a moment and just kind of talk about this. Did the disciples invent Jesus? Some people believe that the disciples invented the claims that Jesus uh, that Jesus made. So Jesus made claims. Some people would say the disciples invented that. Well, there's problems with that. A very un-Jewish thing to do, given strict monotheism and the duty owed. A rabbi by his students so his students would never put words in the mouth of their teacher and that was a anti-Jewish thing to do so very important also if Jesus didn't claim to be God why would the disciples want to portray him as a blasphemer so if he didn't do that why would they want to do that thirdly Jesus divine self-understanding is inseparable from his life and his teachings um, so what Jesus said, his understanding, how he lived, why he said it, all those types of things, it's inseparable from the way that he lived and the things that he did. And so it goes together. And so these, these are some of the things that we can look at when we're talking about um, people, the claims people make about Jesus, his disciples inventing these claims that Jesus made. And that's not true. Uh, Jesus made the claims, they took them and ran with them and were willing to die for these things because they're truths. All right. Now these, I'm going to share with you some more secular, um, 
evidences and proofs that Jesus existed. And we're going to see these through some historians, through some lawyers, different people like this. Uh, the first person is Tacitus. He was a senator, a historian of the Roman Empire, um, not Christian, anything like that. Um, and, and he wrote, he spoke of this. He talked about Emperor Nero blamed the Christians for the fire that destroyed Rome in AD 64. The Roman historian Tacitus wrote this. Nero fastened the guilt on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius in the hands of Pontius Pilate, and a, and a most mischievous superstition thus checked for a moment again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of evil, but even in Rome. He's speaking very early on in the um, in uh, in the first century, speaking about these things and and writing down the history. He would have had the he would have had personal accounts, eyewitnesses that spoke to him about this. He would have had um, things written that explained what Jesus did. And he also would have spoken with people that had been changed by the lives of the disciples. And so Tacitus was a great person to give us some history on these very things, even within the first century. We see the same thing with Pliny the Younger. Uh, Pliny the Younger was... Um, was a lawyer and author and magistrate of ancient Rome as well. And so he, um, Pliny relates some of the information he has learned about these Christians. They were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light. When, this, when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a God and bound themselves by a solemn oath not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, adultery, never to falsify their word, nor deny trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up, after which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. He spoke of these people having a different lifestyle. He spoke of these people being uh, people of honesty and loyalty and goodness and kindness and people that were uh, not living as the way of the world. And he spoke of them. There was a huge change, of course, in these people's lives. And, of course, uh, Plenty of the Younger speaks of that. Evidence from Josephus. Many people know the name Josephus. This man was a um, uh, Romano-Jewish scholar, historian, Hagiographer, um, born Jerusalem, part of the Roman Judea. Um, he was truly a historian who brought a lot of wonderful, great information to, and support for Jesus Christ, of course, living. In his writing, the Testimonium Flavianum, the re relevant portion declares, Josephus wrote, about this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, for he wrought surprising feats. He was the Christ. When Pilate condemned him to be crucified, though who had come to love him did not give up their affection for him, on the third day he appeared, restored to life, and the tribe of Christians has not disappeared. He speaks very strongly as a from a true, legitimate historian uh, perspective that Jesus Christ was a real human being. He lived in this life, and of course he speaks to his deity in this passage. Another thing is evidence from the Babylonian Talmud. The Talmud, or Babylonian Talmud, is central text of rabbinic Judaism and a primary source for Jewish religious law, Jewish theology. There's a lot of books that are, and there's a lot of different translations of this, but it's speaking of the Jewish laws and, and the way that things uh, laid out. And so I want you to see what's in this. The most significant reference to Jesus from this period states, On the eve of the Passover, Yeshu was hanged. Yeshua is also Jesus, and this is would go by Yeshua, was hanged. For, for 40 days before the crucifix execution took place, a herald cried, He is going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. The word hanged here is also a synonym for crucifixion because we talk about Jesus hung on a cross. He was hanging by nails. Um, and so 
the Babylonian Talmud speaks of this with um, with the Jewish uh, authorship that we have there. Evidence from Lucian. We see here Lucian of Samosata was a second century Greek satirist, satirist. In one of his works, he wrote of the early Christians as follows. The Christians worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. It was impressed on them by their original lawgiver that they are all brothers from the moment that they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live after his laws. He's speaking of the Christ. He's speaking of Jesus. All right. Now, a few of the things that Jesus claimed that it's important to look at in the evidence is given to us by secular people uh, as well. What did Jesus claim? Well, in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. In John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am, taking on the same um, wording as what we'd say the Tetragrammaton or Christ or, or the, uh, the Yahweh. Um, unlike the rabbis or the prophets, Jesus speaks with authority equal to God in the first person. Amen, amen, I say to you. Jesus forgives sins, even sins against others or God. Disciples ask to believe in him. And Jesus identifies himself with a visitation of Yahweh. These are all important. And one of the things that Jesus did is that he received worship. And that was a major deal for an actual human to receive worship. And only Christ could receive that true worship. And because of these things... Something very unique happened uh, later on with a famous person named C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis gave us what is called the trilemma. Um, the trilemma for C.S. Lewis is this. Jesus claimed to be God. C.S. Lewis believed that only one of the three options were possible. Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic on the level of one who thinks he's a poached egg, or he's Lord. We cannot say that he was a great philosopher, ethical teacher, prophet, moral example, but not God. And so he's bringing all these up because he's saying either he is lying about who he really is, and he's trying to deceive everybody by making these claims, or he really believes what he's saying, but he's not it, which would make him a lunatic. And if he's not those things, and if we're going to put the calendar that we use today to reference significant dates, whether it's our birth date or our death date, whatever it might be, every date on the calendar, it refers back to this man. Why would he be so significant? Why would he be called a prophet if he was really just a liar and a lunatic? Because who would say these things? And so C.S. Lewis, along with other um atheists who've become Christians call this the trilemma and they say he must be God. He must be the Lord. All right. Well, it's good to be with you today in Lesson 17. I hope you have a great rest of the day and we'll talk to you soon. God bless you. Bye-bye.